Jordan Peterson sat down with Muhammad Hijab in a Muslim mosque, and Hijab took this opportunity to try and convert Jordan Peterson to Islam, and it didn't go so well, and he got some pushback. So I'm going to let that video start playing, and then I'm going to give my thoughts as we go. Let's get into it. I've read all your books, and I even read some of your peer-reviewed work, because when I was going to speak to, to you, then I said, you know what, I'm going to do my, my homework. Yeah. So I read everything. One of the things that you said one time in The Maps of Meaning, you started off the book by saying, when you were a young lad, I don't know how, how young you were, you said that you found the doctrines of Christianity incomprehensible and absurd, yeah? And you also said that you found you had some kind of issue with Christianity because of the Genesis narrative and how in, incongruent it was with scientific narratives. You went to a pastor, you said, or a church cleric yeah. or something, and then you left the church. Now, I've got yeah. a question. Do you still have the same position or have you changed your position? Well, I've changed my position a lot. I was only 13 then, you know, oh, and I, okay. was, I was caught up in, in the battle, you know, to, insofar it was manifested in me when I was 13. I was caught in the battle between enlightenment rationality and mm. traditional narrative belief. Yes. I had yes. no idea how to reconcile those two things. Do you, do you feel like you can do that now? I'm doing my best to reconcile. So let me be yes, more and I think, yeah. well, I certainly can do it a lot more than I did when I was 13. Let me give you an example, right? This, this point, when you were 13, I think you were thinking straight. I'll be, I'm sorry to be very straight. <laughs> For, it's hard to believe yeah, that yeah, someone yeah. is disagreeable with you yeah. as you no, would manage you were, that. Because someone with an IQ of 180 or whatever you have, yeah, someone of your intelligence, when you, were, when you were 13, you probably had an IQ of, I don't know, 120 or something, yeah? So you, was, you were operating like my friend over here, Ali Dawa, so it's on his level, well, at the age of 13. But what I was going to say was that, you know, the reason why I think you are... Because look at the Trinity, for example. Look at the schisms. Now, this goes to your specialism. The, the idea of three all-powerful entities, that Jesus is all-powerful, that the Father is all-powerful, the Son is all-powerful, and the Holy Spirit is all-powerful, but there's not, all, what, uh, there's not three all-powerful, there's one all-powerful. You have one ultimately willing being, which is a person, which is Jesus, and another person, which is ultimately willing, which is the Son. The Quran says about this, it says, in chapter 23, verse number 91, it says that Allah has not taken any son and he, does, he did not have any creator with him. Had that been the case, they would have stripped one another for what they, they would have competed and tried to outstrip one another for power. Meaning this idea of three all-powerful persons is unintelligible to say the least. The idea that Jesus Christ exhibits two natures. For, I know that there are schisms and there's differences of opinion among Christians. But the, the fact that you have this human nature where Jesus is walking and he sees the tree and he can't eat from the tree. He doesn't know that the tree is uh, in season or not or that he doesn't know when the hour is or whatever it may be. The Quran says it very clearly. Him and his mom used to eat food. This proposition that they are limited and unlimited at the same time is unintelligible. It's a contradiction. It's an affront to logic. That's it this will cause you cognitive dissonance because if you want to be a rational actor and you want to see, be that's the thing. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to be a rational actor. But you do when you do your scientific experiments. That's true. So why do you why do you separate the two things? Because rationality should be subordinated to something above it, and I'm trying to subordinate myself to that, and so. My, my reaction to what you're saying um, mm. is that it's an in, this isn't an insult. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm telling you what my reaction is. Please say it's it. not It's yeah. not even a criticism. Of it's, course. I find the discussion, that discussion, as soon as it started, I found that less interesting than what we were doing before. It was harder for me to focus okay. on. And I, right. I think the reason for that is that it... It, it transforms to some, and I'm not saying this isn't necessary at some okay. times, but it transforms the transcendent into something like an intellectual and propositional discussion. And so in okay. some sense, we're debating perhaps not the fine points of theology because yeah. they're more like the blunt points of theology. Yeah, yeah. But there's something about that that, there's something about that that isn't what I want to do with you. Yes. You know, and it isn't that it's not necessary.
Muhammad is right that the Trinity is a mystery, but Jordan Peterson also rightly points out that it doesn't matter if we can understand it, what matters is if it's true. And it reminds me of a debate that Muhammad Hijab had with David Wood, and David Wood made the same point, and then he uses three Bible verses to justify the Holy Trinity, and Hijab did not have a good answer at all. And so I'm going to give you those three Bible verses now. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So here you have God and the Spirit of God hovering over the waters. Interesting. The second one is, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. And so who is he talking to here? The third one being, Draw near to me and hear this. This is God speaking. From the beginning, I have not spoken in secret. From the time it came to be, I have been there. And now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. So God is speaking and God is saying that he's sent with God along with the spirit of God. But now we're going to see Jordan Peterson. He's going to press Muhammad about why he believes in Jesus. So let's see how it goes. So let let me flip it around to some degree. So one of the things I'm very curious about is obviously the figure of Christ is contentious. And so... The Jews don't know what to make of Christ in some fundamental sense because he seems like the last, he seems like an, what would you, a continuation of the prophetic tradition in some real sense, plus he was Jewish. So that makes things complicated. And then, Mm -hmm. of course, the Christians put the figure of Christ as, as central in some real sense, but that begs the question of the relationship between Christ and God. And then in the Muslim community, Christ is also a central figure. And so... I'm curious about that. And we could say we have doctrinal differences about what constitutes that centrality. It's like, fair enough. And I would also not say that I understand what that centrality means. Mm -hmm. And I know that in the Western tradition, that's part of what has been conceptualized as the fundamental attribute of of the figure of Christ. And I know that Christ is central in the Muslim tradition. And so one of the things I would want to know is, why do you believe that The figure of Christ is central in some sense, or maybe I've got that wrong, although I don't think so. Why do you think the figure of Christ is central both to the Muslim faith and the Christian faith? And what do you think that says about what we share in common? Because I really don't understand that. It's a mystery to me. Okay, Uh, so Jesus Christ, if secular historians will look at him and differ on his existence or not, the majority, to be fair, do believe he existed. Right, the even secular historians, atheists and agnostics and whatever it may be, right? It's the simplest explanation. Yeah, it's the simple, of course. Yeah, so I believe that first of all, Jesus Christ existed, which in the modern age is worth noting, right? Mm-hmm. Muslims actually, be- Muslims are the only other major world religion who believe in uh, Jesus Christ as the Messiah, as the prophet. Right. He, he had the right. virgin and birth. This is a strange thing. Yeah, so we yeah, should definitely yeah, be yeah. trying to sort that out. All right. So this is the first point of commonality. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in his miracles, mm-hmm. that he, he cured the blind with God's permission, that he raised the dead with God's permission. We believe that he even, you know, uh, he, he created a, some things which in the Gospel of Thomas, not mentioned in the Bible, like, you know, the, but uh, for example, the, the clay bird and so on, that he blew into it and it became an actual bird, uh, that he cured the leper with God's permission. We believe that he was one of the mightiest human beings that have ever lived on the earth. And we believe that his mother was the best woman who ever lived on the earth. The Quran actually explicitly says that. Well, that seems like a good starting point. I find it interesting that most of the world religions out there all have something to say about Jesus. I mean, the Muslims say that he's coming back to judge the world. Buddhists say that he was an enlightened teacher. The Hindus saw him, well, at least some Hindus saw him as a divine avatar. Uh, The Jews said he led a revolt against the Romans, and the Baha'i faith says he's a manifestation of God. And it's also compelling to me to consider that there is a consistency across the historical accounts among the Jewish historians, the Roman historians, and the early Islamic texts all about Jesus, all confirming that he was a real historical person. And if Jesus isn't divine, I'm wondering why all these religions decide that they have to have something to say about him. And on another note, why is Jesus the most mocked religious figure of our time? None of these things prove God, but it definitely raises some questions to me. But now Muhammad, he's done trying to skate around things. He's just going to real bluntly ask Jordan Peterson to join Islam. And well, 
you'll see how it goes. Let's get into it. I want to ask you a question just before we end. Yeah, sure. Is that, is I, that I've okay? only politely sat here just to indicate we need to wrap up. Okay, but I just want to ask one, one last question because I'm interested in both both of you, both of you in a sense. Yeah, I said that you know from from a Muslim perspective, the question that we're asked to ask is bring the evidence. Yeah, if I were to bring reasonable evidence, which would satisfy some kind of probabilistic reasoning, that the Prophet Muhammad, we believe, is the final prophet, right? That he was a true prophet. Would you be willing to become a Muslim? I wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't dispute a priori the idea that Muhammad was a true prophet. Okay. But I don't understand what that means. <clears throat> so like what, obviously, yeah, yeah. so this is the way I'm going to look at this psychologically again. You know, hmm. it's people are granted revelations, and it's obviously the case. Let's speak empirically mm -hmm. that the revelation of Muhammad. Yeah. united a fractious society. And so it was a uniting revelation. Now, how to conceptualize, but it's not a universally uniting revelation, at least not yet or yeah. not now, because we're not all united. So the, why? Well, why? Well, maybe we didn't understand but, the revelation but, 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 properly. Is, That's is, one is, possibility. Is the presupposition what you're saying, that unity is the ultimate objective? Well, not exactly, you know, because okay. then you have the problem of uniformity that you, you pointed no, no, out. No, even, right? even, even the idea of unity itself. I mean, is, is there Well, not... we talked about... Okay, so no, unity is a great... This. Just to be clear, uh, yeah. I believe that unity is a great objective, yeah. but I don't think it's the all-defining one. For example, um, if, there's a, if there is an injustice that is so great that disunity is more appropriate, then I can imagine situations where disunity is probably better than unity. Right. I'm sure you can as well. For example, like in well, the Soviet that, Union, that would be a false unity. In yeah, some yeah sense, exactly. Right? So right? that's what. Well, we're that's why about. you wanted to address the elephant under the car yeah, yeah, right away. Exactly. We can't have a false peace. Exactly. And we but, can't incorporate things we can't yet incorporate. Yes. And no. what, what, the reason why I'm bringing this to your attention is because I feel like it's my duty as a Muslim, especially in the mosque, right, to to, to tell you that. Um, as Muslims, we believe that the previous dispensations, as they were, like Christianity and Judaism, they are part of our faith, in a sense. Not in the sense of believing the doctrines and all of that kind of thing. Like, we obviously don't believe in original sin or the, the resurrection, the crucifixion, all this kind of thing. We don't believe in any of that. Or the Trinity, of course. Um, but in the sense that we do believe in Jesus Christ, we believe in all of the Old Testament prophets, most of them, if not all of them, you know, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and so on. I don't understand the question exactly. He wants I'm, to know if you'll convert to Islam. No, I'm saying that. No, that wasn't. <laughs> I mean, that's the question. Well, look, I would say yeah, to some no, degree, but, 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 it's not up to me. No, no, but, some I, but my question was, my, my, just to remind you, the question was, if I gave you evidence that would satisfy a certain level of probabilistic... No. So you wouldn't? No, because that isn't how I evaluate the situation. How would you evaluate it? Well, for me, the proof of faith is the attractiveness of its adherence. And that's something to think about, right? Well, are you a shining example of the Muslim faith? Well, how hard do you shine? In case you missed it at the end there, Jordan Peterson just said something kind of brutal here, which is basically that he's not going to follow any sort of religion that has teachings or followers that are not fostering unity and peace. And I think in recent decades, we have seen Islamic terrorist groups who are doing terrible things to people and they are using verses in the Quran to justify what they're doing. So now I'm gonna give you two of the main ones that they use to do that. Then when the sacred months have passed, kill the polytheists wherever you find them and capture them and besiege them and sit and wait for them at every place of ambush. And then another, fight those who do not believe in Allah or in the last day and who do not consider unlawful what Allah and his messenger have made unlawful and who do not adopt the religion of truth from those who are given the scripture. Fight until they have given the Jizra willingly while they are humbled. Now, these verses, they do have a certain historical context that a lot of Muslim scholars will point to to help defend them, but there are still active sects of Islam who interpret these verses literally and it promotes violence. And I think Jordan Peterson recognizes that. And I think that's part of the reason he doesn't want to become a Muslim at this time. But if you want to learn more about the differences between Islam and Christianity, I'm going to throw up another video on screen. It's ex-Muslim Nabil Qureshi, and he does a deep dive on the Quran and its verses about why he left Islam, why he thinks Islam is not a religion of peace, and then gives some other reasons for why he thinks Islam false. Uh, with that being said, have a great day, y'all. Bye-bye.